Surpassing Excellence Academy has been using Zoom for two years, maybe even more, and we have developed considerable expertise in handling the technical demands. For most of that time, we have had both all single and hybrid single group meetings. But the expertise doesn't end there. SEA meets only twice a month, one meeting on a weekday evening, the other Saturday morning. Many of the experts in SEA are also members of Smile Club in Pocatello. And due to Smile meeting every Wednesday, the learning curve was quite short. In addition, we started using virtual meetings before the present crisis, partly to deal with poor weather, partly to deal with being homeless. The combination of me members of SEA and SMILE, some of whom are the same people, were also the main driving force in the evolution of this past spring's District 15 conference and contest. Division B was assigned the task of producing that event, which started out at a, as an ordinary event located at the Clarion in Pocatello. After months of planning, in early March, the principals, including Division B Director Terry Ackley and SMILE Treasurer Teresa Norvik, met at my house in Pocatello as a group and Zoom conferenced with the top three, including District Director Chris Pervant. It was then that the decision was made to go virtual. In May, the two events, a week apart, were finally unveiled and the reaction was uniformly positive, even gushing. The Division B team set a high standard for virtual meetings in District 15. Two factors were crucial to that success. First, the substantial expertise drawn from SMILE and of course, SEA. Second, the decision to engage in several practice sessions to work through the challenges and solve them before the final event. SEA has continued to pioneer developments in using Zoom to meet and speak and my speech is part of that learning process. I will focus on the specific of dealing with gesturing under the constraints of virtual communication. Identifying those constraints is my first purpose. Consider the three intersecting dimensions speakers deal with, up, down, left, right, and forward, backward. The obvious constraint is left, right because the camera severely reduces the range a speaker can use while remaining large enough to be easily visible. But that's not the only challenge. As speakers, we don't often use the up-down dimension other than the difference between a full body appearance versus typical camera-constrained head and shoulders. But the front to back dimension is rarely exploited fully. Consider this simple challenge. In a normal meeting room, a speaker might be five feet from the front of the audience, but the distance from the front of the audience to the back could easily be three times that, 15 feet. So the distance from the speaker to an audience member can vary from five to 20 feet, hardly insignificant. But the human visual system evolved to overlook, pun intended, that difference. People in the back of the room simply don't seem to detect much difference from those seated in front. But with the use of a camera and microphone, suddenly that difference looms large. And knowing that, there are only a few ways to deal with the challenge. I will mention that the speaker's voice level is an important factor, but that is a different subject, not directly related to my topic of gestures. Certainly the necessary use of the camera imposes broader border constraints, mostly left to right, but also up down. Some of you might have seen Teresa Norvik's Tall Tales speech in which she simply vanished from the camera's field of view, dropping through the floor. You can't gesture when you're out of range of the camera. That is a fact of reality. You have to know that and arrange your gestures for when you are within the camera's view. That can mean rearranging the content so the gestures continue to parallel the spoken matter. The average person's wingspan, the distance from fingertips to fingertips when your arms are outstretched to either side is very close to your height. I'm just over six feet tall, so my wingspan is also close to six feet. If the camera were to encompass the entirety of my wingspan, it would have to be set back from my body and the size of my face would be reduced 
making it more of a challenge for you to see any facial gestures I also wanted to convey. I would have to separate those gestures to reduce that conflict. One way to do that is eliminate gest entirely gestures using my hands, using only the stretch of my arms. For example, if you're telling a fish story, simply stretching your arms apart might be sufficient, even allowing the camera to chop your arms off at the elbow or higher, because everybody would know that your arms extend farther even, that, even though we can't actually see the lower arms and hands. Back to front gesturing, walking closer to the audience or back up, backing up can be done, but you have to make sure that nothing is lost in the transition. Start with the closest approach to the camera, making sure your head and torso can be seen. So when you back up, more of your body is in the camera. Doing it the other way risks self-decapitation when you move forward. Just a few inches either way can have an outsized effect, and it is only by watching the recording that you can determine what works for you. In all of these exercises, it can be of great help to have an assistant, not just handling the camera, but also helping you to mark the region within which you can move with no problem to your audience. If you're going to stick to the head and shoulder approach, reaching forward requires you keep your arms within the field of the camera. This requires practice, recording yourself and then watching the recording, repeating and fine tuning until you know how you need to reach to keep your arms and hands in view. Some of you have seen the humorous speech of Anita Janis, where she holds up an imaginary newspaper in one hand and uses short gestures to identify the picture of the Fred Myers parking lot and the circle of yellow police tape. As with larger gestures, repeating them the exact same way recalls the context every time, making it real to the audience. Getting those gestures right took several iterations to make sure that the camera filtered audience could see what Anita wanted to convey. One easy to follow rule of thumb is to limit any hand gestures to the spaces on either side of your head and above your shoulders, but not above the top of your head. That's a severe constraint, and there are always reasons to go outside those boundaries, but you need to be careful as going too far outside can mean the fingers are invisible. Gestures are often very personal and getting them right for the audience is also a matter of practice and error correction. Nothing I tell you without knowing your specifics and working with you over the airways can make you effective in using this new mode of communication. This is something you have to figure out for yourself. I hope I have identified for you several aspects of what to look for. I'm sure you can identify people you know who qualify for this description. If you force this person to sit on his hands, he wouldn't be able to say anything. Gestures are more natural for some people than for others, but we all need to learn how to deal with the challenges of the camera and screen to solve our own personal communication challenges. Thanks to our combined rich and varied backgrounds and experience, we at SEA can help you. Live long and prosper. Mr. Toastmaster. Thank you.